Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Aerospace and Space News Roundup. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. This week, we will bring you updates on a massive round of funding from a Chinese commercial Earth observation company, a bit of a roundup on the year that was in Chinese launch, some updates on the Gaofan and Yaogan constellations of Earth observation satellites. But first, Jean will give us a rundown of the recent updates on the Chang'e 5 lunar sample return mission. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome you aboard the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. Thank you. And Jean, take it away with Chang'e 5. Absolutely. So um, Chang'e 5 this week once again made the headlines. Um, if we pick off from where we left off last week, which was November the 29th. Um, so Chang'e 5 had launched on top of a Long March 5. Um, it had separated once it had reached um, space and it put itself on an Earth to Moon orbit. And after a series of burns in the vicinity of the Moon, it inserted itself into lunar orbit. That's, that's where we are at. And since then, it has made a, a lot of progress over the past week. Uh, first of all, the lander has detached um, from the orbiter and has performed an autonomous landing on the moon. Um, the lander also performed, once it was on the lunar soil in the area called the, the Sea of Storms, um, it performed a drilling, it scooped up the samples and put the samples onto the ascent vehicle. So that was for the core part of the Chang'e 5 mission on the moon. Uh, but at the same time, it also took some very, very nice um, pictures, I think, that are unprecedented in terms of resolution um, of the moon and of the area in the Sea of Storms. So I just want to uh, share perhaps a, a few photos of this. Um, I can see your sc oh, Yes, we are, we are good. And I do see there's the Chinese flag on the moon. We got some pretty, uh, man, some pretty epic photos for sure. There, there, yeah, yeah. There are two photos I, I'd like to share. Basically, there's the first one, which is a panoramic image. As they took a few of these, I, I think I, I saw at least two. But basically, what the panoramic image is is you take multiple pictures um, and then you stitch them together, enabling really unprecedented resolution. So you see that the resolution on this image is quite nice. Um, but the thing is, you can also zoom in and still maintain this um, really impressive resolution. So let me just um, show you what I mean. So I zoomed here on the foot of the lander. And um, I, I don't know if you can see the screen share plane, but it's crazy. You can see. Yeah, that is pretty incredible. Yeah, every grain of yeah. dust. You can you can feel that the lunar soil seems a bit soft, although you're you are putting a two ton or three ton or wait, was it two or three tons of lander onto the lunar soil? So that that's that is some weight. Um, and so that's that's the first image. Very very nice. And the second one is the one that you, you just saw a few seconds ago, Blaine, which is. Um, the Chinese flag, so which definitely reminds us of uh, of the Apollo missions, and so this was really discussed a lot on the social media in China and also outside of China and on the Chinese internet. And what's funny is um, interesting is that um, this this flag definitely took a little bit of work. There was discussion on how um, they had to maintain the extension arm and the flag below one kilograms to make it work. And um, they also had to cal calculate, you know, the angle with which the camera was taking the photo to make sure that the, you know, the flag was within the frame, but also you had the lunar background, you had a little bit of space. So there are actually entire teams working on this, on this flag. So um, that was also a very um, symbolic uh, picture, I think. Um, and just just a few points, uh, last few points on the on, on the update on Chang'e five. Uh, once the ascent module had the samples on board, it took off, leaving the lander on the lunar surface. It was no longer necessary, and then the ascent module uh, reached the orbiter and they rendezvoused. They and then performed an autonomous um, docking, which was a, a world first, and I mean in lunar orbit. The samples were then transferred just yesterday on the orbiter and successfully. And in the next few days, the, the orbiter will then um, enter a Earth to Moon trajectory. Presumably, we will get our hands on the samples. Or, or, I mean, our hands. The Chinese will get their, their hands on, on their sample by uh, mid-December, normally. And I guess it kind of reminds me, there was, I think, the Chang'e 4 mission. They had the two, it would have been Longjiang 1 and Longjiang 2 satellites that were both made by the HIT. 
and they were kind of supporting. So what? The Chang'e two had the, and I could be wrong. I'm, I'm kind of. Uh, how would you say? I'm. Um, oh, I'm freestyling here, but. Chang'e 4, I think they had the Chuechiao Relay satellite, and then it also had the two Longjiang satellites that were both made by HIT. And I remember the the two Longjiang satellites, they were kind of like, you could, as a, as a sort of amateur uh, radio operator, you could communicate with the satellites and try to get them to take photos of specific areas, something like this. And there's a phenomenal online sort of depository of photos taken by Longjiang 1 and 2, um, uh, you know, some of them are like, you know, the moon and the earth in the background and just some really amazing photos from these satellites that are maybe a hundred and less than 150 kilograms, I'm going to say. Um, so yeah, we can definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well. But the, the Chang'e 4 mission from, I think, two years ago now, I guess, or last year, um, with those two satellites, it reminds me of that. But some pretty amazing photos from the Chang'e 5 mission. And certainly, um, it's a big accomplishment. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And, and I guess also interestingly timed with the, uh, is it the Japanese Hayabusa 2 that is now coming back to Earth, having taken some samples from an asteroid yeah. that should be arriving um, relatively soon, although it, it's a bit outside it of It actually it arrived just yesterday um, and successfully. Arrived just yesterday. So, so yeah. yeah, it's, um, mm. it's, uh, it's another sample return mission. Well, congratulations to JAXA. That's pretty Absolutely. cool. Yeah, that's mm. good stuff. And, so um, maybe just the last yeah, point ahead. also that's interesting for, for Chang'e 5 there um, the when the lander performed an autonomous landing and also the docking phase between the ascent module and um, and the orbiter there were instruments that were provided by Kasik the radar and the also the radio altimeter so that's interesting to point out that um, you know you have Kasik providing these systems to um, CAST which is making the Chang'e 5 spacecraft and it's worth pointing out that these um, Although we generally, a lot of people oppose these two um, state conglomerates, they're also very able to work together on the, this type of mission, hand in hand. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, and sometimes they just hate one. Well, hate is a strong <laughs> word. Sometimes there's sometimes there's less cooperation, but indeed, um, for this particular mission, Kasich is uh, is pulling their weight as well. So that's congratulations for sure to the CNSA and to everyone involved in the Chang'e Five mission. That's a pretty inspirational thing to have seen uh, happen, and we do hope that those samples get back safely because that is the most important uh, part of the mission at this point. Um, anything else, John, on, on Chang'e 5 or on All any good. sort of lunar related things? I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey for the first time last night. So I have a totally different prospect of, you know, concept of the moon right now. It's been a really weird 24 hours in that regard. So moving on then to, um, to a massive, and I use the word massive often, but this is genuinely massive round of funding uh, from a commercial, well, a, a debatably commercial Chinese Earth observation uh, satellite manufacturer and also satellite operator, uh, Charming Globe or CGSTL, Charming Globe Satellite Technology Limited. Um, so it is a Chinese Academy of Sciences spin-off based in Changchun, uh, Jilin province, and the, the, the name Changchun and Changguang, the Chinese name of the company, there's a little bit of wordplay there. And so this company, um, so they are already one of the leading Earth observation companies in China. And just a couple of days ago, they completed a 2.4 billion with a B RMB, uh, which is about 375 million US dollars uh, pre IPO round of funding. And this is, as far as I know, it is not only the largest uh, Commer largest funding round by any Chinese commercial space company in any vertical of any kind, as far as I know. Um, but it is also, as far as I know, the largest funding round for any Earth observation company worldwide. So, for example, before this call, I had a look at the fundraising total for Planet Labs, which is about 375 million. So this single round by Charming Globe was roughly equal to the amount that Planet Labs has raised up to this point. Uh, now, that is not to say that you know fundraising is the same thing as being an advanced company technologically. It's not to say that Charming Globe is better than Planet Lab. Um, but nonetheless, impressive that Charming Globe raised uh, almost 400 million US dollars a couple of, of well, earlier this week. Um, also interesting is the fact that the company has called this their pre-IPO round, which implies, I presume, that they are planning an IPO in the relatively near future. Um, that's going to be interesting to see for a couple of reasons. Uh, whether they decide to IPO on the Starboard, which is the sort of um, tech stock exchange in Shanghai that is meant for companies that are a little bit higher risk and less financially certain, uh, or whether they try to IPO on a larger stock exchange, I would have to imagine they would go with the Starboard, um, partly because I, I Yes, they're probably not profitable. Um, the most recent figure that we have seen for Charming Globe in terms of revenues, there was an interview given with one of their higher up people in 
beginning of 2020. And they mentioned that in 2019, their revenues were around 100 million RMB, so like 15 million US dollars. So still um, a vastly, vastly smaller scale than this funding round. Um, but yeah, overall, it's, it's, it's an interesting development. Again, they have a lot of money now to develop their, their constellation. So uh, Charming Globe, they have about 25 satellites in orbit currently, and they have ambitions within their constellation to get to 138 satellites by around the mid-2020s. And that is what this uh, funding is primarily going to be spent on. Uh, one other point that I would mention about Charming Globe, and then John, I'll give it over to you for your thoughts. Um, the fact that they are one of these sort of very interesting hybrid companies insofar as they are, again, a CAS spinoff. So they're, they're related to the state in that regard. They have some funding coming from the local government of, of Changchun. So Changchun is a sort of, um, it's a medium-sized city in China's Rust Belt. They have a lot of old kind of heavy industry and their provincial government and the city government, so the provincial government of Jilin province and the city government of Changchun province is very much trying to bring back some degree of economic vitality to their part of the country. And in this regard, I think things like space are appealing in the sense that they are seen as being relatively fast growth and also as being, um, well, as requiring relatively highly skilled workers. And so I think we are going to continue to probably see cooperation between Charming Globe and the municipal government of Changchun or the provincial government of Jilin and potentially the Chinese Academy of Sciences and also potentially the various um, uh, the various financial institutions that have participated in this most recent funding round. Um, but yes, overall, uh, a very, very large sum of money transferred to the bank account of Charming Globe. We wish them well with spending that 375 million US dollars. We are both, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're open to, to work uh, if, if, the, if the possibility were to arise with 375 million US dollars. That is, that is not bad. Uh, but Jean, any, um, anything from your side on, on Charming Globe? I think that's a very interesting piece of news that you bring up here this week. Um, and I, from a more macro standpoint, I think it's fascinating to see how the China Academy of Sciences, the CAS, which is sometimes often actually overlooked by a lot of uh, non-Chinese media, is really instrumental in bringing a lot of technology and also the spin-offs that go with these technologies um, to the Chinese space industry. So definitely Charming Globe is probably the best example. There are others like like Laser Fleet um, or, or Space OK or CAS Space and all these companies. There, there are others. And um, I think also it's interesting to point out that CAS Space does play a significant role in funding for these companies. Um, so mm. I'm sure that at some point we should do a, a dedicated episode to really decipher just to what extent the Chinese Academy of Sciences is playing an important role alongside Kask and Kasich um, for, the, for the Chinese space industry. You know the most famous CAS spinoff in any industry? Have you heard of the... There's one company that is a globally known company that is a CAS spinoff. I guarantee you've heard of them. I guarantee you, well, I bet you might have one of their products, maybe 30% trans. Do you know the company I'm talking about? No, I use a win I, I use a window a Microsoft laptop. So I guess you're talking about Lenovo. <laughs> I'm talking about Lenovo, yes, and I I, I suppose uh, yeah they are probably I guess the largest CAS spinoff probably. Um, and you bring up an interesting point about the CAS. It's like for example, I was visiting um, I guess it would have been the beginning of last year a satellite operate uh, sorry a satellite manufacturer not Charming Globe uh, that had also been spun out from the CAS. And when visiting them. We, we went to the sort of the CAS uh, innovation park or something outside of Beijing, and that's where this company's office was. And so they were apparently renting or, or, or well, they, they had been, they were using CAS office space, and I don't know whether they were paying for it or not, but uh, it was literally just like, this is the CAS building, and then over here is this sort of like somewhat partitioned area where it's this commercial satellite manufacturer that has been spun out of the CAS. And it, it kind of reminds me of, um, a phrase that I hear often used, and I may have used it on this podcast before, that it is hard to start a commercial space company in China or any company. Uh, it is even harder to kill that company. So these companies, they, they don't really die. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, you could have a company that is getting relatively cheap or free office space from the CAS and that has um, relatively lower operating costs than any like you know Western equivalent. And it makes it easier for these companies to just kind of survive. So um, I think definitely, yeah, it, it's uh, the CAS is 
it's a large, large institution with a lot of, of influence. So I think definitely a, a full, uh, you know, a full unpacking of the CAS in a dedicated episode is uh, is something that we should look into in 2021. In the meantime, anything else on your uh, on Charming Globe from your side, John? Or are we uh, all good? Good on Charming Globe. So just to keep the theme with Earth observation, we have uh, Yelgon and a Galfun update. So the first about Yelgon, which is less of an actual event so much as it is just a really, really excellent article. Um, so there's a French aerospace and space blog and the name I'm drawing a blank on and I feel bad because I should give them a shout out. And it is the eastpendulum.com is the name of this blog. And the, the author every six or eight or 12 months, they just publish a really excellent deep dive article into Yalgon, uh, which is just for our viewers that may not know, it is a earth observation slash kind of signal intelligence slash kind of military constellation that is, has been launched by China over the last several years. And these satellites are launched in trios, in, in groups of three. And the, the article is, is just, it's, it's a really interesting perspective on um, admittedly a little bit speculative perspective on why is China launching the Yaogan satellites and what are they being used for? There's a very heavy emphasis on having signal intelligence information about Taiwan and, and, and specifically Taipei. And there's some really great data visualization of sort of um, what times of day do the Yaogan satellites have, uh, you know, have, have a, a, a good view of Taipei in, in terms of the signal intelligence information that will be coming from there. And um, yeah, again, it's just it's a really really excellent article I think about uh, about Yalgon. Um, so highly recommended. Uh, Jean, anything from you on Yalgon, or would you like to roll right into Galfan a little bit with the launch? Um, not much more on Yalgon. I think you covered it quite well, and there's not that much more to say as it is a very secretive operation. Um, on on Galfan uh, 14, that was launched. So that was launched yesterday morning on a Long March 3B. This is an additional satellite to the starting to be quite large of a constellation that uh, Galfin is. Um, the Galfin 14, if I if I read correctly, is um, a, a very high resolution uh, optical satellite with, um, I think, sub, sub, uh, sub meter level resolution that's available and that will complement the Galfin 7, which is a similar satellite. So that was launched yesterday and um, will probably be, be operational in the in the coming weeks. Excellent. Well, interesting, uh, interesting stuff with Galfan. I think um, certainly it's, it's one of those things where I read a, a pretty, pretty good. I think it was a, I think it was an article, um, but the author was talking about whatever you do, don't spend money launching another Earth observation constellation because there's just a crazy number of Earth observation satellites up there, and this data is all, you know, relatively. Um, uh, it's all relatively commoditized insofar as like you can only have so many pictures of the same place, and it was. Um, it, it brought up some interesting questions. I mean, I, I certainly, I question that a little bit. To what extent is is it really a commodity? Because you can certainly get a lot more granular in terms of like timing of information or otherwise of different you know, different types of of, uh, of Earth observation data. But but yeah, certainly a lot going on with uh, with Galfan and Yaogan and with Earth observation in general coming out of China. I think this is certainly an area to continue uh, to watch for. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, anything else? Are we? Uh, I think we're we're good on the week for. Uh, yeah. I'm good, all good. Okay, all good from my side as well. So thank you very much for listening. This has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space and Aerospace Blog. We would like to spend a send a special thank you to our good friends at GoTaikonauts and at SpaceWatch.Global for their continued support and also for their continued excellent reporting on not just the Chinese space industry but the global space industry as well. And this has been the Dongfang Hour. China Aerospace and Space News Roundup for the week of November 30th to December 6th. We look forward to seeing you next week. I'm Blaine Curcio, uh, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for watching. Bye.